Welcome to my second futures video. I'd like to talk about the carry model. And uh, the carry model basically is a relationship between the futures price and the uh, spot price. And it basically says the futures price is equal to the cash price plus carrying costs per unit. Carrying costs per unit were defined in the last video. Again, I'll remind you that they include financing costs, storage costs, insurance costs, and transportation costs. And this model simply says that at in equilibrium, so very important, in equilibrium, equal, yeah, that's my notation for equilibrium, in equilibrium, the futures price will equal the cash price plus carrying costs per unit. The reason is, as for the reasons indicated in this example. Let's say you need to have silver bullion, which is used in a lot of production processes, in one month. You need some silver bullion in one month. There's uh, at least two ways of having that occur. One is to buy silver bullion today, and then in one month, as long as you store it, uh, you'll have silver bullion. Another way is to today take a long position in a silver bullion futures contract that has a delivery next month. And if you do that, then you'll pay the cash next month and you'll have your silver bullion. Two ways of doing the same things. As you can imagine, uh, the price that you lock in for the futures contract does have some sort of relationship between the spot price that you'd pay if you bought the silver bullion today. And the idea is those prices will differ by carrying costs per unit uh, in equilibrium. Now, carrying costs per unit uh, really means for the uh, most efficient uh, market participant. Uh, okay, so this is the relationship. And um, let's look at some numbers. Let's assume right now a, this, the price of silver bullion, spot silver, is uh, $17 uh, per ounce. And let's assume the silver bullion f futures contract uh let's say uh, you know let's say for for may uh is has a price right now of 1730 per ounce okay let's also assume that our quantitative analysis tell us they believe carrying costs per unit for silver bullion uh are uh for this, you know, for one month, would be 20 cents per ounce. Okay, so these are the prices we're going to take as given, and we'll see what happens here. Okay, so it ends up that we, based upon these prices, we are not in equilibrium. Okay, and uh, the reason is, uh, remember, futures price equals cash price plus carrying cost per unit. The reason is that uh, the futures price of seventeen thirty does not equal seventeen dollars plus twenty cents. So we are not, in, you know, we're not in equilibrium. That doesn't equal, you know, left hand side is not equal to right hand side. So um, <clears throat> if these were the prices, and uh, again, this is a price, that's a price. This is just. Uh, an estimate by our quantitative folks, and we're going to assume that it's a good estimate. But because we're estimating this, what we're about to do is not an arbitrage. Even though it's sometimes called an arbitrage, it is not a pure arbitrage. So sometimes you see the term, and I'll use it a lot, quasi-arbitrage, Q-U-A-S-I hyphen arbitrage. Remember, arbitrage is a riskless profit. Quasi means it's kind of a riskless profit, and uh, kind of a riskless profit is not a riskless profit. But it's an interesting uh, series of trades, so we'll, we'll follow it through. It ends up being very important, and uh, the naming is just something we just have to uh, get accustomed to. Alrighty, so... What do we do if these are our prices? Well, here's what we do. At date zero, okay, we go short a silver bullion futures contract uh, for May. 
So we go short one, silver bullion futures contract of the May contract, okay? Then here I'm going to have the cash flow associated with that. Well, uh, when you take a short position in futures, you're just agreeing to a price that you will be willing to receive in the future. So there's no, there's no cash flow at date zero. Okay, so there's a zero dollar cash flow. Next thing I do is I take a long position in spot silver. Spot silver bullion. Okay, and that price we see up here is $17 per ounce. Okay, so cash flow there minus $17. And so the idea is I got to finance this. So I'll say here, borrow $17. So my cash flow at date zero with the borrowing ends up being nothing. Okay. Well, what happens at date, you know, at settlement? We'll call it date one. What happens? Well, at day one, let me see. I'm short the silver bullion futures contract. Um, so I am obligated um, to deliver silver bullion. And I see here, oh, I do, I have silver bullion uh, right here. Uh, I've got it. I've got silver bullion. So I, I, I'm able to deliver. I can do that. I can honor my obligation and so at date one i um deliver spot silver bullion per my obligation o b l i g and then what's the cash flow at date one well uh, hmm the price that i locked in was 1730 so I will receive $17.30. And then what else? Well, I was long spot silver. I was long spot silver bullion. And therefore, um, I effectively have to, I'll keep it in green, pay my CCPU, which the analysts estimated were 20 cents per ounce. So we can see right there. Well, so I pay um, 20 cents. Having trouble with this pen. So I will pay 20 cents per ounce. And here I'm receiving the 1730. So what am I left with? Whoa, well, I also have to remember something very important. I've got to repay this $17 loan. Okay. So there's minus $17. I've got to repay my seventeen dollars, and when we look at this, then we see that the net cash flows seventeen 
1730 coming in. 20 cents going out, $17 going out. I'm up 10 cents. Now, in this example, we're pretending that the size of the silver bullion futures contract is one ounce. Now, of course, that's ridiculous. In the real world, silver bullion has a, a couple of contracts that I'm aware of. One is 1,000 ounces, another is 5,000 ounces. But we need not complicate this uh, example by worrying about that. We can just pretend that our silver bullion font futures contract has a standardized size of one ounce. And therefore, the spot silver we buy is uh, one ounce, consistent with the size of the contract um, for the uh, futures contract. So one ounce. All right. Well, we'll make a dime per ounce. That's interesting. Uh, <clears throat> let's assume that let's assume that um, the transactions cost associated with uh, conducting this um, is less than ten cents. Let's say significantly significantly less than ten cents, and um, therefore. We profit. And how many times will we do this? Well, as many as we could. As many as we can. And, uh, hmm, these prices that we started with up here are not equilibrium prices. Not equilibrium. And we know that because we were able to uh, earn this 10 cent profit. We're going to keep doing it, doing it, and doing it, and doing it. And what are we doing? Well, we are buying spot silver bullion and selling the futures contract. So we're driving down the futures contract price and we are drive we are increasing the spot silver bullion price. And if you think about it, that's exactly what has to happen to get this, these prices back in equilibrium. <clears throat> the gap between this price and this price should be 20 cents. And what's going to happen is, as we and others continue executing this trade here, shorting the silver bullion futures contract going long spot silver. As we keep, as we all keep doing that, we're going to affect the prices. And as the futures contract price falls, remember it's at uh, 1730 by assumption. And as the spot silver bullion price rises, remember it's at $17 per ounce by assumption. As this falls and this rises, eventually they're going to come to a point where the difference between them is 20 cents. <clears throat> Let's say this ends up at uh, the futures contract price being 17.25 and the silver bullion price, the spot silver bullion price uh, being 17.05. Now we see this difference here is 20 cents. And if that difference is 20 cents, then we will not have a, an arbitrage profit here. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. <clears throat> there are other pairs of prices that would give the same result. Um, 1726 and 1706 would do it also. You know, it's not lots of pairs, but let's just assume this is where we end up. And when that gets to that price, look what happens. 1725 and 05, when 
<clears throat> this price becomes 1705 instead of zero. And um, we got to borrow 1705. <laughs> and then over here, this becomes, when we sell it, we get 1725. And uh, here we repay 1705. Look, we got 1725 minus 20 cents minus 1705. Well, that would get us to zero. It's no longer profitable. And so what's interesting is that in attempting to profit from the mispricing of the futures contract, selling the futures contract, which is which was overpriced relative to the price of spot silver, given the carrying cost per unit. In doing that, we start moving prices such that an equilibrium will be restored. Now, the goal of the uh, quasi-arbitrageurs is not to bring the market into equilibrium, but that is a consequence of the trading behavior of the quasi-arbitrageurs. Now, there's a name given to this series of trades, and this is called a cash and carry quasi arbitrage. Cash and carry quasi arbitrage. And um, <clears throat> that's how that works. And so the idea is that if there's a mispricing between the values given in that little table there, things aren't right, then an arbitrage opportunity opens up. I should mention that the arbitrage opportunity has to be large enough to cover transactions cost, of course. Okay, and this is uh, cash and carry quasi arbitrage, and it's very important. Now, there's an important concept uh, in futures, and that concept is referred to as the basis. Okay, the basis. Let me get this color changed. Okay, so the basis. And the basis is equal to the cash price minus the futures price. Okay, basis is a very important term. It's equal to the cash price minus the futures price. That's just the name. And in the last example, the cash price was uh, 17, and the futures price was 1730, and the basis was therefore minus 30 cents per ounce. Minus 30 cents per ounce. Well, you can probably guess where I'm going with this. In equilibrium, we would expect that the absolute value of the basis would equal carrying costs per unit, right? In equilibrium, we'd expect the absolute value of the basis to equal carrying cost per unit in equilibrium. Remember the full carry model? It said futures price is equal to cash price plus carrying cost per unit. We can also <clears throat> state this as uh, cash price minus futures price equals negative CCPU. Same thing. <clears throat> we usually talk about carrying cost per unit as being positive. So I like to say that in, equil in equilibrium, the absolute value of the basis is equal to carrying cost per unit. And we've already seen what happens when that's not true and uh, when the price of the futures contract is higher than it should be relative to the spot price of silver bullion, then cash and carry quasi-arbitrage activity occurs. 
and for a while people profit, the arbitrageurs profit, and eventually markets are restored to equilibrium. And um, cash and carry arbitrage opportunities are 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 uh, executed uh, frequently, um, and we have to realize that the traders, the arbitrageurs, actual trading behavior is what causes good markets to return to equilibrium. Okay? They don't want that to happen, but that's what happens, and that's a very important uh, piece of uh, knowledge to take out of, of this. Now... Generally speaking, if we look at time on the horizontal axis and prices on the vertical axis, okay? And here I'll have, uh, there's the contract settling in one month. There's the contract that settles in two months, three months four months, generally speaking, we will see a relationship. And of course, zero would be the spot price. Generally, we'll see a relationship that looks like this. Okay, there are those prices. And then I'll just connect those dots with a line. And we generally see that type of um, relationship between these prices. And this is referred to as a contango market or a carry market, okay? And um, for now, we just will look at it as having a positive slope. And, but we'll see there's more to it. If we assume that this line right here was the equilibrium, okay, let's say that's, uh, draw this line here and I'll say full carry, implying that it's, it, it's a, an equilibrium uh, set of price relationships per, at various points in time. If we recognize that as the full carry line, what we just saw in the prior example was a circumstance where the futures price and, and what we have here, these are, these are futures prices. Let me make that clear. The prices of futures contracts. And what we just saw was a circumstance where the price was higher than it should be. Maybe that was the price and it should have been here. And let's just assume that that's the case for all of these uh delivery dates. In other words, there are several um, uh, futures contracts at any one point in time for silver bullion with different uh, delivery dates. And if we assume that they're all mispriced in a, in a similar manner, we would have the line kind of look like this. And that's the circumstance we just had. Again, we just were focusing on this one. So if, if this is full carry, then this was a circumstance where um, cash and carry uh, quasi-arbitrage was called for, this circumstance. And the, the line, the, the relationship between futures prices and various settlement dates... Um, was steeper than this full carry um, line that we see there. Now, the, the issue with the example we just saw was that the futures price was too high. Now, let's just think for a second what that means for for the basis. Remember the basis was equal to cash price minus futures price. Okay. And if the futures price is too high, 
if this value here is higher than it should be, it means this basis is going to be lower than it should be. The basis is usually negative, right? The, because cash price is lower than futures price usually. And if this gets too big, the basis keeps getting more and more negative. If the futures, the futures price, which in equilibrium, is usually higher than the cash price, so it causes CP minus FP to be negative, but if the futures price gets bigger than it should be in equilibrium, then the basis would also become more negative. The basis would also become more negative than it should be. So a cash and carry quasi-arbitrage is executed when the futures price is too high and equivalently when the basis is too low, too negative in this case. Okay? Too negative. When the basis is too low, we would execute a cash and carry quasi-arbitrage, uh, which is the same as saying when the futures price is too high. That's enough for this video. Thanks for watching.